All right, open your Bibles this morning. Jeremiah chapter 18. You want to find Romans chapter 5 also. And as we begin today, I want to share with you a thought that literally has dominated my thinking all week long. Has never left me. Just permeated everything. That, I was, uh, that, that we've been doing and talking about. And it has everything to do with understanding what the lake of fire is not. If you remember, I mentioned a couple of weeks that, ago that my, my goal is not to explain what the lake of fire is because the Bible does not tell us what it is. Men's interpretation of it Outside of its context, you know, there are 65 books before you get to the book of, of Revelation. And men arrive at the book of Revelation, especially chapters 20 and, 20 and 21, and all of a sudden they impose their Augustinian views into those chapters, disregarding the rest of the Word of God. And so... My goal is to show us, through the process of elimination, what the lake of fire cannot mean. Because if there are, there are certain things in the Word of God that if they are true, then what we have been taught about the lake of fire is an absolute lie. And this is very important. So what have I been thinking about all week? Well... I've been thinking about this verse here in Isaiah chapter 6. I know I asked you to get Jeremiah. We're going, don't worry. But I, I've been thinking about this verse, Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. We are the clay. And Thou our potter. And we are all the work of thy hand. Now this verse is full of meaning. God created, God made Adam from the ground. Ground that was like clay, that was moist. And he formed him. And he fashioned him. And when Adam came from the hand of God, there's one thing we can be certain of is that he was a perfect specimen of a man. Now think about this. Before God created man, He created Lucifer. And He knew Lucifer would fall. And He allowed that to happen. In His sovereignty, in His omniscience, in His unlimited understanding, in his infinite wisdom and understanding, God allowed that to happen. And then after he did that, he took a piece of clay that he had, and he formed him, and he put him in the garden, and he allowed the wisest creature, the wiliest creature, the most deceptive creature, to approach him and her by, by that time, that would have been like allowing the most renowned scientist in quantum physics to come into your home and argue the theoretical basis of physics that explains nature and the behavior of matter and energy on an atomic and on a subatomic level and to argue how particles are created and destroyed and the interactions between those particles even from a distance. That would destroy the mind of an eight-year-old. The depth of that wisdom and the sophisticated theories of quantum physics. But in essence... That is what God subjected Adam to. And did Adam fail? Yeah, he certainly did. He did. But according to this verse, 
who's the potter? And who's the clay? Does clay do what it wants, or does clay do what the potter wants? God is sovereign. So the clay was fractured in the garden. Look at what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 18. And remember, remember this verse. Thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. That's every human being. And then Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. So Jeremiah is about to hear the words of the Lord concerning the potter. Who's the potter? Who's the clay? <laughs> okay. Verse 3. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold... He wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Now, think about this. Every human being is nothing but a piece of clay. Adam was molded. He was fashioned, he was formed by God in the garden. And no sooner had God made Adam, Adam was subjected to the wiles of the devil and he was marred. Marred means disfigured or cracked or fractured. And that's, man became that. He became marred. Something was wrong with him. And then we read in Genesis chapter 5, And Adam begat children in his own likeness after his own image. So now we're all duplicates of fallen Adam, each and every one of us. We all experience the same desires, the same passions, the same lusts, the same frustrations, the same anger, the same lack of patience, the same sicknesses and diseases, depressions. We experience excitement and hope and, and fear, and the list goes on. There's a, it's a conglomeration of effects that we all experience as Adam's fallen children. And all these are a part of the human experience during the first part of our journey through life. Because I mentioned either last week or no, the week before that there are two parts to our journey from the time we're born. Every single human being from the time we're born, there are two parts. The first part is what we're in now. This, this part. This fallen part. And the second part is the eternal state where everyone and everything will be restored to the way Adam was before he fell. That's called reconciliation. To reconcile means to restore to the original state of being. So between the first part of our journey and the eternal state that we're all headed to is the resurrection. Here's a verse that shows us the two parts of our journey very clearly. And it's a verse that we're all very familiar with. It's Romans chapter 8, verse 18. The apostle said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time. 
That's the first part of our journey. Okay? But this first part are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That's the second part in the eternal state. And then in between these two extremes is the resurrection. Now, if you remember last week, I showed you the video with the two donkeys. Anybody remember that? Right? Will and Shrek. How that this man, Philip S. Childs, saved them from such horrible life. Well, I spent an hour and a half, an hour and 40 minutes yesterday on a video chat with Philip S. Childs. And it was a great blessing because he's a farmer and the experiences of his life from the time he was a boy like I was, he experienced all the same things I experienced with nature and everything. He shared with me an illustration. I said, listen, I'm going to be sharing this because it blessed my heart. And I'm going to share it a little differently than what he shared it with me because I'm adding some ideas in there, but one of his illustrations that he shared with me was, he said, suppose a little girl grows up in a palace, and she's waited upon by servants and only knows the best things in life, the best food, the best clothes, the, the best furnishings. He didn't say all these things. That's what the parts I'm adding, okay? The best bed. The, you know, the most beautiful portraits on the walls, the best, you know, the best flooring, the best, the best of everything. She grows up in this environment. She will think that this is normal. And ultimately, she will not appreciate all that she has. And eventually, she will take all of this for granted. But then... As she's grown, one day they bring her down to the slums where people are living in poverty and filth and squalor. And she's dropped off there and, and told, this will be your new home. You think then she'll appreciate where she used to be? She can only appreciate where she used to live because now she has something to compare it to. And that's why God allowed man to fall. Had man stayed in paradise, the most beautiful place on earth, abounding with the most luxurious gardens and fruits and rivers and trees and the best of everything, had he stayed there over a period of time, he would have taken it all for granted and thought, well, this is just how it is. And in that place and in that mindset, he would have never learned about God's mercy, God's patience, God's long-suffering, God's grace, and he would have never known God's love because it was already there. It, everything he needed was there. But because God put the deceiver in the garden and they succumbed to it, they fell. Just think of when God banished them from the garden. Think of the first couple as they walked away from the garden. And God had placed the cherubim with flaming sword to keep the way of the tree of life. And as they walk away, they turn around and they look at what they've just lost. And now they're introduced to another way of life, a life of guilt and shame and sorrow and regret and pain, and sickness, and death, death, 
this is the part we've inherited. Not based on anything we did. We're born into transgression. Not of our own free will. You didn't choose to become a sinner. You, be, you sinned because you have a sin nature you inherited, but it had nothing to do with you. That's, this is the first part of our journey. This part of our journey has a purpose, and it's to prepare us to appreciate the last part of our journey that will last for all of eternity. Then he shared with me this other illustration. He says, suppose that a man grows up in a dungeon, a dark, wet, damp dungeon. All he has is bread and water once a day. On a ledge is a cockroach. And every once in a while, he gets a visit from a little mouse. And when the mouse comes in, he gives him a little piece of bread. He doesn't feel like stomping on the mouse. Like maybe someone would want to do now. No, rather he says, how you doing little fella? And he sees that cockroach on that lid and on that ledge and it looks like it's looking at him. And he says, how are you doing today? And he has a little crack in the wall. And there's a little bit of light coming in. And that's all he's got. And in the dark, lonely hours of his life, he has those two companions that keep him company. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. No matter how good you think you have it in this life, at best, we are in a dungeon filled with sickness and sorrow and pain and loneliness and depression. And for many people in this dungeon that we live in now, no hope. That little girl in Calcutta who washes herself in the Ganges River to wash away her sins because she wants to go to heaven. And she thinks that's the only way she can get there because that's what she's been told. She doesn't have a 1611 King James Bible. But someone told her there's a God. And she wants to know, what do I have to do? And she does what she can based on what she knows. And then one day, the man in that dungeon, the door opens. And the guard says, someone's here to set you free. And come to find out, it's the father of the little girl who grew up in that palace. And he brings him to the palace and he gives him the whole thing. Do you think he can appreciate the palace now? Does he have a contrast? Does he have a past that he can reflect on? and the beauty and glory of his new and forever home? For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, that's the first part of our journey, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. 
Jeremiah 18, verse 4 says, And the vessels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. There was something about Adam, even when he was made, that allowed him to fail and fall. We've all been marred by the fall of Adam. Like I said, the word marred means disfigured and cracked and fractured. Every one of us is fractured. Somehow, some way. All of us have something wrong. You look at yourself in this world and you know something is wrong. But notice carefully. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. He made it again. Isn't this God telling us exactly what he as the potter is going to do with his flawed and broken and fractured creation called man? He's telling us exactly what he's going to do. There are hundreds of hints like this in the word of God, of his plan for his creation. And if it's going to happen like this, then what we've been told about the lake of fire in the book of the Revelation has to mean something other than God tormenting his creation for eternity. I mean, think about, think about this. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. We are frail, weak, little creatures, pieces of clay. Does an omnipotent God get more glory by casting a defenseless piece of clay into a burning oven for all eternity? Or does he get glory by taking a broken fragmented piece of clay and fixing it and restoring it and making it new so that for all of eternity it can live with him. See, any monster, any monster can create something, then be disgusted with it and throw it into a garbage can and light the garbage can on fire. Any monster can do that. Any Fake God can do that. But a loving Father? The God of mercy? He's not a monster. The monster of the Augustinian theological system of eternal conscious torment and torture is the God that has been embraced by Christendom and the dispensational community, but that's not the God of the Bible. That is not the God of creation. That is not the God who said, I am love. He's a loving heavenly father of whom his own word says, Psalm 145 verse 8, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works, and we are the work of His hands. Man, what have we done? What have we done to disfigure the glory of God before the eyes of the world? Christendom is the reason why people do not want anything to do with Christianity. Who would want a God who says, believe in me or I'll throw you into a burning, fiery furnace for all eternity? I saw a meme on Facebook. You know, you've seen that 
a, a picture of, you know, G, this man with long hair and a beard standing before the door, and it says, I stand at the door and knock, right? So there's a few blurps. Some, the person on the inside goes, who is it? Yeah, I'm Jesus. What do you want? Well, I want to save you. Save me from what? Save you from what I'm going to do if you don't open this door. And that's the view of, of that's the view Christendom has of Jesus Christ and of God. Believe in me or I'm going to throw you into hell. That's the view that we've all had. And it's a deceptive view of God. It is not the God of the Bible. I'm seeing people now. It's the God of Greek mythology is who it is. You know, it's like Thor. The God of war. You know? I'm seeing people now who are twisting scripture to make it say what they want it to say. They speak of the eternal second death and the eternal lake of fire. Oh, did you know the word eternal is not even found in the book of the Revelation? It's not even found there. Matter of fact, there has never been a word in Hebrew, Greek, or Latin for the word eternity. The word eternity is not a concept in man's understanding. Matter of fact, here's a book it's called How Eternity Slipped In. It's written by Alexander Thompson. He was born in 1889. He died in 1996. This book was written in 1935. He traced the word eon and eonian, which are limited periods of time. He traced that word all the way back to 400 years before Christ. Who used the word, how they used it, when they used it, and how it eventually became to become the word eternity, but it never meant that. Ever, ever did it ever mean that. That's why when you read in your King James, like, and in the Latin, there's a word, and I'm not going to explain all this to you, okay? I mean, I, should, I would recommend get the book, How Eternity Slipped In. It's only 45 pages. But in Matthew 25, about, it talks about eternal punishment. The King James translators had a vast knowledge of Latin, Hebrew, Greek. They knew, they knew the word eon meant a limited period of time. They knew it meant that. That's why they used everlasting punishment and not punishment for eternity. That's why. You know, they've been slandered for, yo, they put the word eternal. No, they knew that that word meant temporary period of time. We're the ones who've been duped by Christendom and Augustine into thinking that the word means eternity. The word never meant eternity, ever, 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 ever. So the point of what we're looking at today, what we've looked at so far, is if God is going to make another vessel, which he will with us, this is not the finished product. Oh my goodness, thank God for sure. Then it stands to reason that the lake of fire will be used in the process of making the new creation. And it will be remedial, not destructive, or annihilation for eternity. Because the Bible said God will make all things new. All things new. And he, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Those who say that God will not make all things new, that he's going to take you, resurrect you at the great white throne judgment, and then cast you into hell with your body, doesn't believe these words. God said, these words are true and faithful. I make all things new. 
And the next verse says, it is done. Because God speaks those things that be, that be not as though they are. But what else, what else can we look at that gives us comfort? Where's my clock? <laughs> I know we have a lot of things going on. But what else can we look at in the Word of God that will give us comfort in knowing that our Father is not a monster, but that He is the Savior of all men? There was someone in social media a few days ago that had the nastiest things to say. In a, he was, in a thread, he was talking, to, and he was talking about the lake of fire. And he was being nasty. And he was judging everyone. And he was really enjoying talking about, yeah, they're going to be cast into fire for all eternity and, and the second death. And he was waxing eloquent. And he sounded like he was a really, really angry person against those who had not had the privilege of hearing the gospel like he had. And I responded to him. And I'm going to read what I responded. And I'm going to put it up here so you can read it with me as I go along. I think, I think there's better clarity with that. But I said, I said, according to you, the Bible is God telling the story of his own defeat. How sin proved itself to be too strong for him. And the devil will win the overall battle for the souls of men. So because of the devil, God has to cast his own creation into eternal torment because Satan's deception was greater than the sacrifice of God's own son. John 4.42, who is the Savior of the world, and John 1.29, who taketh away the sins of the world. The God of Christendom is a weak God who can only save a few and lose 99% of his creation to his weak little adversary, the devil. I used to serve that weak God. Now I serve the omnipotent God, 1 Timothy 4.10, who is the Savior of all men. 1 Timothy 2.4, who will have all men to be saved. And 1 John 2.2, 2, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The God who was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation is not the word of condemnation, like you have demonstrated in your above posts. It's not the word of judgment like you have so perfectly demonstrated. It's the word of reconciliation that God came to man in Jesus Christ to reconcile the whole world. God is not angry with anyone because of Calvary. Not everyone today is seeing or understanding this glorious gospel. But God is not finished yet. God is not done. The reason God is not done is because God is still working. Remember after God created everything and he rested on the seventh day. Remember that? But then man fell. Right? Right? And then we read in John chapter 5, Jesus Christ said, Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, which means until now, and I work. What happened to God resting? I mean, after the fall, God began to work towards the salvation of all his fallen creatures. Jesus Christ said, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. It's his work. God has been working since the fall of man until this very day that you and I live in right now. Don't think for one second 
that God has been ignoring his creation no matter how bad things look. Everything that has happened every single day is God's doing. You may not realize that, but the greatest surprise Satan will have is that one day he's going to find out that he was doing everything exactly the way God wanted him to do it. That's the sovereignty of God. Just think if there was a rogue power in the universe that God did not have control over. What kind of God is that? He's a God who can't control his own creation? That's the God of Christendom. That's not the God of the Bible. You understand? He does exactly what God wants him to do. You might go, yeah, but Brother Rodney, what about all the evil in the world? Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? The Lord does that. There's a reason for it. You need to understand that everything that happens happens according to the plan and the purpose of Almighty God. Remember the dungeon that we're living in? We're living in a dungeon right now, filled with sickness and disease and depression and evil. It's all planned by God. That's called God's sovereignty. And then a short time before Jesus Christ went to the cross, he said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. How did he finish the work? And he hadn't even gone to the cross yet. He had lived a perfect, holy, harmless, undefiled life that qualified him to go to the cross. And it was at the cross that we see that the purpose of God's plan was this. John 1, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He taketh away the sin of the world. That was what the work accomplished. Think about that. I didn't write those words. I just believed them. It will be in your best interest to believe the words. Who brought sin into the world? Adam. You all know that. Who undid what Adam did? He undid what Adam did. But did he really undo what Adam did? Not according to Christendom. I asked you to mark Romans chapter 5, right? I know you're going to remember because we went through the book of Romans. And I taught, and I thought, that Romans chapter 5 was about the eternal security of the believer. Boy, was I wrong. Boy, was I wrong. Romans chapter 5 is not about the eternal security of the believer. It's about the salvation of all men. And how Jesus Christ undid what Adam did in the garden. And how perfectly he undid what Adam did. Romans chapter 5 is about two men. It's about Adam. And it's about Jesus Christ. And I will tell you that Christendom gives Adam more power and greater authority than they give to Jesus Christ. Let me show you what I'm talking about, beginning at verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, 
for that all have sinned. This is something Adam did to perfection. Do you know anybody who hasn't died? You know anybody who isn't going to die? No, you don't. Then notice verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, even though sin was not imputed, death reigned from Adam to Moses. In other words, even when there was no law saying, don't do this, do this, don't go there, don't eat that, don't blah, 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 death still reigned. That's how perfect the sin of Adam ruined mankind. Even over them that had not sinned. That is the perfect ruin that Adam brought to the whole race. Because death is universal because of Adam. And he goes on after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Adam was a type of what was to come in Christ. Now that, I will explain all that in more detail later. I got a message coming just on that topic, just about that topic. But Adam, notice in verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Not as the offense. Adam's offense brought death. The free gift is not like the offense. Because the offense brought death, the free gift brings life. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, well, how many are dead? Well, all those who died are dead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so many is all. Because they're all dead. How many more will die? It's appointed unto a man once to die. Okay, You're not, not going to escape that. Everyone will die. So the many, the many, is really all, because all are many. Right? I mean, if you got all those people, well, that's many people. Yeah. All of them died? Yeah, that's many of them, right? That, that's, the, that's the context and the, the concept being presented in these verses. Notice, much more, much more, that would be much more than the offense, much more than Adam brought death, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. How many? All. You'll see that very clearly in a second. Verse 16. And not as it was by the one that sinned, because he brought death, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. That's the judgment on Adam brought the condemnation of death upon all men. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, now, therefore is a word he's going to explain. Now, I'm going to tell you why he said all the things he just said. Therefore, in light of what I just said, therefore... As by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Now that's clear. 
What Adam did came upon all men to condemnation. Adam's sin brought death upon every one of us. Even so, even so, which means or in the same way, in the same way that Adam's sin brought death upon all men, by the, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. How many did the free gift come upon? All men. All men. This chapter is not teaching the eternal security of the believer. It is teaching the reconciliation of all men. Jesus Christ in this chapter is undoing what Adam did. But in Christendom today, oh no, Adam's sin is far greater than the death of Jesus Christ who died to take away the sins of the whole world. But according to Paul, Christendom is wrong. Deathly wrong. By the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Well, how many were made sinners? For all have sinned. So many is all. For by the disobedience of one, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, shall many, the same many, the same all, shall be made righteous. All will be made righteous. So what Paul, Paul has contrasted for us in Romans 5 is not the eternal security of those who believe. He has contrasted the federal head of the human race, Adam, and how his sin affected everyone. And he contrasted Jesus Christ with what Adam did and how what he did has now affected every single human being in the world. Because of his obedience. And what is it? What is it that Jesus Christ accomplished ultimately? I mean, we see this here, right? I didn't ask you to mark 1 Corinthians 15, but open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We all know that this is the resurrection chapter. We all know that. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 21. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? 12. 15, 12, sorry. <laughs> 15, 12. Sorry about that. It's up here, you know, in case you get confused in your bio. I confuse you with your Bibles. It's up here. <laughs> sorry. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ literally is the proof that God accepted his sacrifice because he finished the work in his life that qualified him to die and to be buried and to be raised again. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee of our resurrection. Then Paul continues in verse 20. Okay, you can read the other the verses between 14 and 20 there, but in verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The first fruits mean there's more. When there's a first fruit, means there's more coming. And then verse 21, for, for 
is a word of explanation and amplification. He's going to tell you what he's been talking about. For, since by man came death. Well, we just read that in Romans chapter 5, right? By man came death. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For, again, for, he's going to explain, as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Verse 22 is the most misquoted verse in the entire Bible by Christendom for centuries. Because notice what the verse does not say. It does not say, for as in Adam all die, even so all those who are in Christ shall be made alive. It doesn't say that. No, it says even so in Christ, or because of his, he was raised from the dead, which is the context, shall all be made alive. You see that? That's what that says. That's what it says. For as in Adam all die, well, because of Christ, all shall, shall all be made alive. That's the most hopeful verse that there is in the Word of God. Verse 23, but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, he was the first one. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Now, I'm not going to delve into this, what this coming is right now. But this is where we know that there are different resurrections in the word of God. We've talked about that before. But then, notice verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Now, listen to this and think about this. The only place in your Bible that explains the end is the chapter we're looking at right now. The book of Revelation does not explain the end, nor does it go all the way to the end. This takes you literally to the end, when it's all over, when it's all done. This end here, this, what we're reading now, this happens after the lake of fire has done its work has done what it's going to do. I'll be continuing this, this thing right here, this, next week. When we will look at where the lake of fire is in the Word of God, time-wise, and its purpose, what it's accomplishing based on things that we know it can't mean. If the things we're looking at today mean what they mean, the lake of fire cannot mean what we've been told it means. Okay, and when all are made alive, when all are made alive, at the end of all things, which is the context here, notice verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, in the book of the Revelation, all things are not subdued unto Jesus Christ. You do not read that in the book of the Revelation. Matter of fact, the last verse in the book of the Revelation, the verse before the last verse says, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. He hasn't even come yet. Okay? So the book of Revelation doesn't take you to the end. And this is a great misunderstanding in Christendom. The only chapter in the Word of God that takes you to the end and tells you what's going to happen in the end, you just read it. Then cometh the end, Paul said. 
He's the only one. And this is very important. But this verse, and when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him. Why? That God may be all in all. That's the end. That's the end. When the dispensation of the fullness of times is done, God will be all in all. He will be everything to everyone. That's after all are made alive because of what Jesus Christ accomplished. Because of Jesus Christ undoes, undid what Adam did. The free gift of righteousness, of justification unto life. This being made a lot, being all in all happens after the lake of fire. The lake of fire is not after this. Now. I know I just said something that I go, okay, show it to us. Okay, well, I can't do it today. But you're going to see it. There's chronology in the Word of God. The book of God is a book of a timeline. And because people go to the book of the Revelation and they arrive at chapter 20 and 21, they make that the end. It's not the end. It's before the end. This is the end. This is the end. And the lake of fire had a purpose so that this could happen. And it's a beautiful thing. I know it's written in a way that looks scary. I realize that. But that's man putting writing it and going. So if God is going to be all in all, and he is, because, you know, I've said, his, I've said this before, there's seven words here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven's the number of perfection. Seven words explain the entire plan of Almighty God from the garden till beyond the lake of fire to the final destination of mankind, that God may be all in all. That's his grand plan and purpose. So if God will be all in all, then that means that the lake of fire cannot be about people spending eternity burning because if that were the case, God could not be all in all. If there are people burning and there are people in heaven, God is not all in all. He's God in some. He's a monster and a curse in others. He's God in some but he's a destroyer in others. Therefore, the lake of fire is not what we have been told it is. But the Augustinian preachers who have promoted this lie embrace it. They fostered it. They have nurtured it for the past 1,600 years. And that's why today, we present messages now about God's love and what he's going to do and Christendom is freaking out and they're falling away and they're leaving and I feel sad. I pray that their consciences will be so violated for looking at their heavenly father like a monster. 
So what we looked at today means that whatever we were taught about the lake of fire in the past cannot be what we have been taught or what we have read today is a blatant lie. Paul's a liar. Well, I'll tell you this. God is not a liar. Man is a liar. But God is not a liar. And if Jesus Christ took away the sins of the whole world, which he did, what a glorious Savior we have. What a glorious Savior we have who paid the penalty for the sins of mankind. And on the cross, he took away the sins of the whole world. Now, who are we? We believe. We're believers. What about those that don't believe? I got news for you. 99% of the world has never heard the name of Jesus Christ. At least 95%. Let's be conservative. Maybe not 99%, but 95%. Don't know what a Bible is. Don't know a way of, don't know the Romans road. Never heard the Romans road. And yet here we are in Christendom looking at ourselves as though we are the answer for the rest of the world. To We have to go tell them or they're going to perish. They're going to go to hell. If we don't tell them, who's going to tell them? And we got, this, this pressure has been placed upon us to go and tell them as though we can do that. Some of these countries you can't even get into. What about them? What about them? Well, I'll tell you what about them. Then cometh the end when God will be all in all. And I'll tell you, when we do understand the purpose of the lake of fire, all this just becomes even clearer, right? You know, I said in the beginning of this that if you stick around, it's going to become clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer as you go. And some didn't want to stick around. They felt they needed to go, so they went. I feel sorry for them. I pray for them. I think it's sad that they would rather listen. I mean... I look at some of the people who've listened to some other people and go, what are you listening to him for? What does he know about the Bible? Has he studied the Bible? No, he's taking from what other people, oh, no, this can't be universalism, and they're freaking out over something they don't know anything about. Anyway, I'm not going to keep going on that. Just know that today... Salvation is by grace through faith. But not everybody's going to hear that. And God knows. He's sovereign. He's omniscient. He knows. He made provision for that. He made provision for that, for them. Just like I keep saying, Thomas said, I will not believe. He represents every person who says, I will not believe. Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, for goodness sakes. Had Jesus Christ not appeared to him, he would have continued his rampage of destruction. But Jesus Christ appeared and stopped him in his tracks. Oh, Saul of Tarsus represents multiplied billions of people who will need to see Jesus Christ. And they will see him when the earth cast out the dead. And the first thing they see, like when Lazarus was raised from the dead, he saw Jesus Christ. Wow, what a glorious... That's the provision God has made for those who cannot hear the word of God today. That's the provision he's made. Those things are not in your Bible uh, to fill space. They're there to educate and to teach us who God is, his plan, how he works with different people. That's what those things are in, there, in the Bible for, you know? 
God's not just telling nice little stories. Amen? All right, well, look, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He is still the Savior. He still wants you to believe. He still wants to save you. He wants you to enjoy peace with God, know the joy of forgiven sins, and just enter into the peace of the Lord, a peace that passeth all understanding. That's available for everyone who does hear the gospel today. Those who don't understand it, those who can't see it, well, there is a day coming. But we are responsible to respond to what we hear and understand. This is the beautiful gospel we have today. How that Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And we trust that. Not for the forgiveness of our sins. Your sins were paid for at the cross. We trust that. And we enter into a relationship with the Lord of peace. That's what, that's, what, that's what it's all about. In the midst of this world right now, I think you could use a little bit of peace. You know, it's not looking good in Canada. Right? It's not looking good here. It's not looking good anywhere. You need peace. This is where peace is found. This is the Prince of Peace. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our, our God and our Father, I'm thankful that I could open the Scriptures and just lay out the way word for word, from the Word of God. Not my opinion, not my philosophies, not what I wish it would say or hope it would say or twist it to make it say something else, but just simply believe the Scripture. I pray if anyone doesn't know you today that, that they would just bow their heart and believe Jesus Christ died for them. I pray that in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.